on the question, what is liberalism? And I thought, <laughs> it's a kind of a strange question because it's, such, it's so broad in its makeup, and uh, I had to scramble for a while to try to, to get specific about answering a question as almost hopelessly broad as that question is, what is liberalism? And I do think it's important that we understand some of these general categories because they're used so frequently and sometimes quite loosely uh, in our culture. So let's take the word and put it here on the board, liberalism. Let me start uh, at the b end rather than the beginning. And notice the last three letters of the word ism. Anytime we see that suffix attached to a word, we know that that suffix ism means that a whole uh, <coughs> cargo of ideas is attached to the root. That an ism is a life and worldview, a foundational philosophy. It's one thing to believe in human existence. It's another thing to believe in existentialism. We all are humans. That doesn't mean we all embrace humanism. So as soon as we put that, those three letters, ISM, we're talking now about a philosophy or a system, a systematic way of thinking. So there is such a thing as a whole framework with an ism attached to it that is called liberalism. Now, to understand the ism, we have to go now and look at the root. There is another word contained in here. The root word is the word liber. And if you know your Latin, you know that that word means or meant originally simply free. You get the word. Uh, uh, liber arbitrium, which means free will <coughs> in Latin. You have the word libertas, which is the word from which we get the English word liberty. All of these words come from this Latin root, liber, which means free. I remember when I was studying in Europe and uh, trying to learn with great difficulty uh, the Dutch language, that a couple of the words that I, I had to learn for my studies were the following two words. One of those words was the word rechtzenig, which means orthodoxy. And literally, rechtzenig means right or correct thinking. Then another word that I had to learn was the word freizenig. And freizenig means liberal or free thinking. Now, please be careful here. I don't mean to contrast. Usually we contrast the word liberal with the word conservative. And I just gave you two different words. One that was the word for orthodox and the other one for the word for liberal. And what I liked about the Dutch word for orthodox was that the meaning of the term was right thinking. And I hope and trust that whether we are conservative or classify ourselves as liberals or moderates or whatever we are, that we all want to be rechzenich. That is, we all want to be correct in our thinking and proper in our thinking. Now, to be liberal, however, in that sense of the language, in the Germanic sense, is, as the Latin sense implies, to be, quote, a free thinker. Well, free from what? Well, I think in its most noble and virtuous sense, to be liberal is to be able to think critically in the sense of being free from the trappings of all human convention and human tradition. I think that our thinking should be under the authority of God and according to His categories. And I never want to be so liberal that I declare my independence from the authority of God. But I do want to be liberal in the sense of having a positive zeal to discover the truth of God wherever it may be found. 
and so the authentic liberal historically is the one who is eager to pursue truth as freely as possible without being enslaved by human conventions. That I believe is a noble enterprise and a noble word and I hope that in, in the sense in which I'm defining liberal there that every Christian is a liberal. Now sometimes in our culture the term liberal means something else. It means completely open to any novel idea, to be open-minded to a degree as to have no convictions, to be always learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. If that's what we mean by liberal or liberalism, I hope that no Christian is a liberal in that sense because that's not a rigorous pursuit of truth wherever it may be found. That's simply being silly, intellectually silly to uh, be wide open to any uh, harebrained scheme that comes down without examining it critically and never allowing the coming to convictions. I remember, of course, when Erasmus of Rotterdam was engaged in that uh, rigorous debate with Luther that they carried on with the pen. Erasmus wrote the diatribe. Luther responded with his uh, classic work on the bondage of the will, and one of the criticisms that that uh, Erasmus had made of Luther was that Luther had come to some conclusions in his thinking. And he said to Luther, he said, I prefer to remain skeptical on these matters and to be a pure academic and to hold my decisions forever in abeyance. And Luther responded with vehement Germanic passion, you know, typical Teutonic Luther. He said to Erasmus, away with the skeptics, away with the academicians at this point. He said, spiritus sanctus non est skeptitus. The Holy Spirit is not a skeptic, and the truths that he has revealed are more certain than life itself. Don't be mesmerized or intoxicated by those who seem to find some virtue in always learning and never coming to a knowledge of truth. Christianity is a religion, it is a faith that is built on the foundation of convictions and of affirmations. Luther again said to Erasmus, you don't want to take, you don't want to make assertions. He said, the making of assertions is the very mark of the Christian. Take away assertions and you take away Christianity. And I think it's important that we understand that so that we don't want to be liberal in the sense of free floating and never landing on any kind of truth. Now, uh, apart from these generic uh, views of what we call liberal and conservative and the like, in theology, the term liberalism has a much narrower definition conceptually than the way the term liberal is used just in normal, casual, uh, ordinary language. The term liberalism in theology refers to a specific movement with a specific agenda and with a defined theology that occurred on the theological scene in the 19th century in Europe. So when a theologian speaks about liberalism, he's usually speaking about what we call 19th century liberalism, 19th century liberal theology. And as I said, it has a definite portrait with a definite agenda uh, and so on. Now, in the 19th century, one of the experiences of Western civilization was a growing awareness of the shrinking of the globe. Travel was, uh, by modern technology, was increasing, and cultures were beginning to blend together and mix together in heretofore unprecedented ways. And the world was becoming a melting pot, and to use the vernacular, the world was shrinking, getting smaller and smaller. Just this morning, somebody said to me, I bumped into the guy for the second time in two days that I hadn't seen in a couple of years, two different places. I ran into the same guy, and he looked at me, and he said, 
Boy, R.C. says it's a small world. And then he paused for a second. He said, but I sure wouldn't want to have to paint it. <laughs> said, yeah, it's small in one perspective, but large uh, from another perspective. But what happened in the 19th century was an increasing awareness, particularly of, of European, Western European thinkers, of things and ideas that were going on in other parts of the world, in the Orient, among Islamic religions, and so on. And a new science emerged on the sphere of, of the academic world, and it was the science of comparative religion. So that students of religion in, in Western Europe were not content simply to study Christianity or to compare it with Judaism. Now they wanted to study Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, Taoism, and so on. And look at all the different religions in the world. And what came out of this new science of comparative religion was an effort in examining all the different world religions at discovering the essential core that could be found running through in various ways and stripes and threads in all these different various religions in the world. In German scholarship, for example, there was one word in, <coughs> in German that began to appear again and again in scholarly publications, in books and journal articles and so on. It became almost a buzzword in the theologian's playground of the 19th century, and it was the German word Wesen. Now, if you know any German, you know that the word Wesen comes from the Ger German uh, participle form of the verb to be. It simply means being or essence. And so you kept seeing books that were examining the essence of religion or the essence of Christianity. And one of the most popular books coming out of Germany in the 19th century was written by the great church historian, the great uh, uh, historian of dogma, Adolf von Harnack, who wrote a little book for popular consumption called What is Christianity? That is, what is its essence? What is its being? Now, this whole movement in German theology, in liberal theology, had certain basic commitments philosophically and theologically. The one that is most obvious and most evident of 19th century liberal theology, in its basic thrust, it was fundamentally anti-supernatural in its orientation. That is, in seeking to discern the essence of religion, it was seeking to get beyond myths, legends, sagas, that sort of stuff that is contained in religious uh, stories and cultic practices in various uh, uh, faiths of, of the world, to get beyond miracle stories and angels and virgin births and dying and rising gods and all of that kind of stuff, and get to the stuff that you find in Islam, in Buddhism, in Taoism, and so on. And the conclusion they came to was that at the core of all religions was basically a concern for ethics, for values, that all the trappings of prayer and the symbols of redemption and the liturgy of salvation and all of those things are really the externals, the negotiable peripheral matters that aren't of the essence. The virgin birth is not of the essence of Christianity. The resurrection isn't of the essence of Christianity. The atonement of Jesus isn't of the essence of Christianity. These things are part of the primitive trappings of religion, but the essence of Christianity is found in the ethical teaching of Jesus, for example, on the Sermon on the Mount. Von Harnack came to this conclusion. He said that we can reduce Christianity to its core two foundational concepts being 
the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. Universal fatherhood of God, universal brotherhood of man. Now one of the strange dimensions of that reduction of Christianity, and I would have to say that's what it was, a reductionism, you know, a, an inexcusable reduction of the core of Christianity to this the simplest common denominator, is the irony of it is that the two core concepts that Harnack saw as defining the very essence of the Christian faith are two concepts that aren't even found in biblical Christianity. Now, in light of uh, the place of where we are in American culture, it may be shocking for an American to hear me say that the Bible does not teach the universal fatherhood of God. And it may be even more shocking to hear me suggest to you that the Bible does not teach the universal brotherhood of man. I mean, how many thousands of times in your lifetime have you heard that said? Universal fatherhood of God universal brotherhood of man. We're all brothers and sisters and so on. It's not the language of Scripture. I will admit that on rare occasions there are allusions to God as the supreme progenitor of the human race and is isn't the sense that He is the progenitor, the creator of everyone, there is a sense in which in that regard he could be called the father of all people. Uh, when Paul says to the Greek skeptics, uh, skeptics at Are the Areopagus in Mars Hill in Athens, he said, as some of your own poets have said, we are all his offspring. The Apostle Paul there acknowledges a link with that uh, sentiment, but ascri ascribes the sentiment to a pagan philosopher, not to Moses. Now the reason I labor the point is this, that in the Scripture, when the Bible normally speaks of the fatherhood of God, it is speaking of a concept far more narrow, far more distinctive, and far more precious than merely being a creature living on planet Earth. Go with a group of Christians, listen to them pray in a home prayer meeting or Bible study, and invariably as Christians pray out loud, one after another will address God how. They'll start their prayer by saying, Father, or our Heavenly Father. It's the most common expression that we as Christians use to address God. And why, why not? When our Lord taught us to pray, He said, when you pray, say what? Our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name. What could be more basic to Christianity than to address God as Father? Jehoiakim Jeremias, the German New Testament scholar, has done research on the prayers of the ancient Israelite people, and it is, it is his conclusion that there is not a single example anywhere in extant Jewish literature, including the Old Testament, the Talmud, the Targums, and so on, until the 10th century A.D. where a Jewish person addresses God directly as Father. That it simply wasn't done. People would say, speak of the fatherhood of God among the Jewish people, but no one would address Him directly, Father. Jeremiah says, you don't find it until the 10th century A.D. in Italy. Yet in the New Testament, we have the record of a Jew, a Jewish rabbi, who has many, many prayers recorded for posterity, and that in every prayer that he prayed, save one, he directly addressed God as Father, and that's Jesus of Nazareth. And what Jeremias demonstrates is that Jesus' use of the term Father for God was a radical innovation, completely unheard of in Jewish liturgy. And what he did in his radical departure 
from convention he invited his followers to be involved with. Because what, the, what Jesus teaches about the human race is that by nature we are not the children of God. This was the dispute our Lord had with the Pharisees, who thought that just because they were born Jewish, that they, that they were children of Abraham, that they were therefore the children of God. Jesus said, you are your father, the, the devil. God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones, because what Jesus does is defines sonship in terms of obedience to God. And because we are not by nature obedient to God, we are by nature children of wrath, the New Testament teaches us, and not universally children of the Father. The only way we ever have the right to call God Father, to cry Abba in His presence, is because we have been adopted. And the biblical message of sonship and daughterhood in the body of Christ is rooted and grounded in this concept of adoption, that only Christ is the natural Son of God. And only if you are in Christ do you become a member of the household of God. It is the church in the New Testament that is called the family of God. It is the church in the New Testament that is called the household of God. And that unique concept of redemption through adoption is completely obscured when we talk about the universal fatherhood of God. Do you see that? Even more so is this concept that Harnack talked of, the universal brotherhood of man. The Bible doesn't teach the universal brotherhood of man. Again, the New Testament sees the brotherhood as something distinctive, restrictive, and special to those who are in Christ. That there is a brotherhood of all of those who have fellowship in the Beloved, who are invited to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, who are marked by the sign of baptism and who are in the family of God. Outside of the fellowship of the church, that brotherhood does not extend. Now, what does the Bible teach? The Bible doesn't teach the universal brotherhood of man. It teaches the universal neighborhood of man. Biblically, all men are not my brothers. If you are a Christian, you are my brother or my sister. If you are not, you're not my brother or my sister in the New Testament sense. But whether you're my brother or your sister or my sister, theologically and biblically, in that sense, you are my neighbor. This is the point that Jesus hammered home. You know, the 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 the, the, the Pharisees wanted to limit the neighborhood and the command to treat every person in the world to love my neighbor as myself to those simply who live close to me. And they came to Jesus with the question, who is my neighbor? And you remember how he answered that. He said, a man went down from Jericho and he fell among thieves. And he was ignored by the clergy. And a despised Samaritan came along and ministered to that man, bound his wounds, reached into his pocket, paid for his physical care and well-being. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan to communicate the point that everybody is my neighbor. And the great commandment to love God with all of my mind and soul and heart and strength and everything, and my neighbor is myself, means that I am to treat everybody in this world with dignity with justice, with righteousness, with charity. And in that sense, there is a universal obligation toward everybody in the world. But it's neighborhood, not brotherhood. See what I mean? Now, the second uh, thing I want to say about 19th century liberalism is that it provoked a, a, a strenuous reaction in church history, particularly in the United States. And the reaction was called fundamentalism. 
And originally, the fundamental res fundamentalist response to liberalism was a response of classical Christian scholarship. Today, in our culture, and in religious jargon, fundamentalism tends to communicate the idea of that which is anti-intellectual, legalistic, simplistic, and primitive. But historically, in the debate between liberalism and fundamentalism, the fundamentalists were so called not because they wanted to reduce Christianity to five or six fundamental points, but they said, look, there are lots of issues in theology that are open for discussion, that we can differ uh, among ourselves in theology in a wide diversity of ways and of points. Lutherans disagree with Baptists, and Baptists disagree with Presbyterians, and Presbyterians disagree with Episcopalians, and all of that. But that there is an essential, there is a vason to Christianity. There is an essential core. There is a sine qua non to historic Christianity. There are certain foundational precepts that are so fundamental to historic Christianity that if you deny those, you have denied the very essence of biblical Christianity. And what fundamentalism sought to do at the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, was to spell out certain cardinal precepts and principles that are the non-negotiables of Christianity. Such statements as the resurrection of Christ. You deny the resurrection of Christ as a supernatural event. You have denied Christianity. If you seek to construct Christianity without the resurrection, you have a religion, if you will. You may have a, an interesting ethical system, but what you have is neither historic nor biblical Christianity. Do you see what I'm saying here at this point? That was the message of the so-called fundamentalist or the conservative scholar at the turn of the century. Benjamin Warfield from Princeton at that time said that the liberals of 19th century liberal theology did not reject mere peripheral matters, but foundational principles such as the Incarnation, the Atonement, and the Resurrection. And Warfield said, if you negotiate resurrection, you negotiate Christianity. And so this was a to-the-death issue, one of the most significant splits in the history of the struggle of the Christian church, the war between historic Christianity and 19th century liberalism as a movement. What was at stake was the authority of Scripture and the very basic creeds of the church. Let me say that it's been said by church historians that historically there are only really three generic types of theologies. There are various sectarian uh, distinctives and the like, but three generic forms of theology. One we would call Pelagianism. The second we would call semi-Pelagian. And the third we would call Augustinian. This goes back to a debate that raged in the fourth century between a a monk by the name of Pelagius who believed that the atonement of Christ was not necessary for human redemption, and the great theologian Augustine. And semi-Pelagianism, of course, refers to a, sort of a compromised position in between. This church historian that I mentioned says that the debate between semi-Pelagianism and Augustinianism is a debate that has been going on for 2,000 years and will continue to divide Christians until Christ comes. It's basically the debate between Calvinism and Arminianism. But it is a debate among Christians. It is a debate of important matters, but matters that are not essential, not the vason of the church, not of the essa 
of the church, the essence of the church. Certainly issues like your view of predestination will influence what we would call the bene essa, that is, the well-being of the church, but don't necessarily touch the very essence of Christianity. You can differ on these things and still be a Christian. But what this church historian was saying is that Pelagianism is fundamentally not only unchristian, but anti-Christian. And he would have put 19th century liberal theology in that category of anti-Christian and unchristian theology. Now, I keep talking about 19th century liberalism. I would like to be able to say to you that 19th century liberalism lived its hour upon the stage, made a splash in the pan in the scene of history, a blip on the radar scope of time in the 19th century, and the church came to its good senses and, and defeated it roundly and soundly at the turn of the century, and that it's just a matter of historical interest now. I would say that the greatest heyday of 19th century theology in the most foundational precepts that it taught and embraced is right now. We are living in what contemporary theologians call the age of neoliberalism, where basically the central and cardinal points of 19th century theology have in many circles, in many institutions, and in many denominations not simply made inroads, ladies and gentlemen, but have in fact triumphed, have gained control. And where in the seminaries and in, in many cases uh, so-called Christian colleges, there is an attitude of outward hostility to classical Christianity, where the doctrine of the atonement of Christ is openly ridiculed. We've been watching the events in Time magazine of this group that has of scholars, of New Testament scholars, have decided that 95% of the statements attributed to Jesus by the New Testament writers are sheer fabrics of their creative imagination. You've seen that. You've, you've read that. <coughs> uh, Rudolf Bultmann, who's one of the most important uh, New Testament scholars of the 20th century and has been described often as a neoliberal, wrote in his little book, Kerygma and Myth, that nobody can live in the 20th century and make use of modern conveniences like electricity, the light bulb, the phonograph, the television, modern medicine, modern technology, atomic energy, and still believe in a world where angels appear to virgins and talk about uh, babies being born without uh, sexual intercourse, and where a corpse that goes into a grave comes back alive three days later. If New Testament Christianity is going to speak to modern man, according to Bultmann, it must be recast. It must be revised. We must come to the Bible with what he calls a certain forverstandness, a prior understanding, where we take modern philosophical systems, such as those from the German Heidegger, and we come to the text of Scripture 2,000 years ago and ask existential questions and get existential answers that help us in our modern quest, but we don't seriously believe in the truth claims of Holy Scripture. Emil Bruner, the Swiss theologian, who was by no means orthodox, wrote a book that was important in this debate in the 20th century version of it, entitled Das Mittler or in English, the mediator, in, in which he gave a, a technical and scholarly examination of the mediatorial work of Jesus according to the New Testament. And in this work, uh, Professor Bruner canvassed the teaching of liberal theology. And he was very candid in his evaluation. He said that he could that is, Bruner, could reduce the striving force of 19th and 20th century liberal theology to one word, un-
belief. The hostility to Scripture, the hostility to the core teaching of the New Testament of the person and work of Christ cannot be seen as a mere difference of opinion on negotiable issues of biblical Christianity. I think Bruner hit the nail right on the head. This is unbelief, and why don't people have the integrity and the honesty to say so? You see, a crisis came to pass that all of a sudden a generation of ministers were educated in 19th century liberalism, and they had no biblical gospel to preach. They didn't believe it. It's that simple. But they had to justify their jobs. They had to justify their profession. And, and so they tried to substitute for biblical Christianity this 19th century concept of the universal fatherhood of God and the social agenda program. It's not that the Christian church doesn't have a social action agenda. It should. But the point was, they said, all that we have left are the ethical issues to be involved with. That's the reason for the church's existence, not for questions of personal redemption. We had enormous investment in property and money in buildings called churches and institutions. What are they going to do? Are the ministry and the clergy going to stand up and say, oh, by the way, we don't believe this anymore. And so we're going to turn our churches into museums. That's what's happened in Europe, by the way. In Scotland, 4% right now of the people in Scotland, the home of the Scottish Reformation, 4% of the people of Scotland are members of churches. And 95% of that 4% attend liberal churches. How do you know whether the church is, is, has, has embraced this uh, theology of liberalism? Look at the statements that it makes, for example, with respect to the ethics that they teach. The newspaper is filled daily with denominations wrestling with such basal principles as whether it is ethical for people to be engaged in sexual activities outside of the sanctity of marriage. Huh? When in the history of the Christian church has such a question even been debated? Before, people would say, I just don't agree with the ethic of Jesus, and if Jesus is teaching that uh, the sanctity of marriage, I think he's nuts. I don't have anything to do with him. But when did anybody ever have the audacity in the past to try to make church law say that premarital and extramarital sexual relationships are within the allowance and the permission of the law of God. You see, liberal theology is not an only anti-supernatural and anti-personal redemption. It is at its core antinomian. That is, it is openly, manifestly hostile to the law of God. And at that point, it provokes conflict. Conflict with Orthodox Christianity. Ladies and gentlemen, if no one has ever called you narrow-minded, you may wonder about the state of your soul in this day and age. Because if you take the slightest stance for the Word of God in this time and in this generation, somebody is going to call you a Puritan or Victorian, or uptight, reactionary, conservative, or something of that sort. But let's not make a mistake that liberalism in theology has not come to mean a simple, honest, rigorous pursuit for truth where it may be found. It does not simply mean that we are free in our thinking from human conventions away with conservatism that is mere reactionaryism. Pharisees were conservatives. The Pharisees exalted the conventions and the traditions of mankind. 
that kind of conservatism should always be suspect in the church. The only kind of conservatism that God wants is the passion to conserve the truth that He has delivered through His Word. And that it is our obligation to conserve and not to negotiate because the particular brand of liberalism that has become pervasive in the Western church is at bottom, I'm convinced, anti-Christianity. And it has provoked a crisis that I think Christians should be willing to die to fight against. Because what liberalism does is that it doesn't simply redefine Christ. It takes away Christ. His person and His work are removed. I went to a seminary where the doctrine of the atonement was received with outward open hostility by the faculty. When I would try to tell people in the church, they simply wouldn't believe me. They said, those men are theologians. They're ministers. You're not really going to tell us that ministers don't believe. And I wanted to shake people by the throat and say, who killed Jesus in the first place? What is it that makes people so naive to think that ministers automatically believe what they profess to believe? One of the most strongest motivations that people have when they're in college and in the university to study religion and study theology is to disprove it. <laughs> we should be aware of that. And people are, are being ordained every day who are openly hostile to biblical Christianity. Nineteenth century and twentieth century liberalism claims a link to historic Christianity, but the historic Christianity to which it claims its link is fundamentally denied. I don't know a nice way to say that, but I say that liberal Christianity is not Christianity at all. That liberalism in its attempt to be Christian, I believe, is the greatest threat to biblical Christianity in this world. It's a lot easier to deal with paganism because paganism declares itself for what it is. But the problem with liberalism in the church is that it claims to be Christian. It seeks to persuade people that what it is teaching is in fact Christianity when it is the antithesis of Christianity. And if we haven't seen that by now, I wonder if we will ever become aware of it. The good news is, and the point with which I'll close, is that I think culturally, nationally and internationally, the world is waking up to the bankruptcy of liberalism. When I was a seminary student, the five largest seminaries in the United States in terms of student enrollment were all liberal seminaries. Today, the five largest seminaries in the United States are all conservative and evangelical seminaries. When I was a, a, a student in seminary, the fastest growing churches were liberal churches, where the evangelical churches were struggling to survive. The liberal churches in the last 20 years, however, have been losing in some cases 100,000 members a year per denomination. Scrambling to have one merger after another just to, to keep alive while the churches that are growing in leaps and bounds are the churches where the scriptures are being preached and where classical Christianity is embraced and proclaimed. And we've seen a whole switch. We're seeing the decline of liberalism and the reemergence of biblical Christianity. And I hope that we will understand that this Christ